My friends, the great experiment. I especially like that sparkly one. Drink, drink. Would you look at that? The greatest drink, drink. Welcome, Bolians and Gorns, to a Star Trek podcast that's so frightful, its hosts are unembarrassed to sell a ghost fucker candle. Today's episode of Greatest Trek Spring Break features an Enterprise chief engineer in a little role that's so tawdry, it could breach an EPS conduit. It's an episode that fires at full spread at Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> Judy, you're not yourself today. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really have the throat to sell the laugh at the end of that. Ugh. I'm Ben Harrison. <laughs> I'm Adam Franica. Your Crypt Keeper sounds suspiciously like <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, I pretty much have one impression. <laughs> yeah. One's all you need when you're a host of Greatest Trek. <laughs> What's your history with Tales from the Crypt? It was a show I was not permitted to watch when I was a kid. You know, like we didn't have HBO in our house either, so that was a pretty easy shield. <laughs> but like when we went over to my grandparents or were like staying in a hotel room or something, that this was like not programming that we were told was good for us. And I think this constitutes the only Tales from the Crypt episode I've ever seen. Wow. And if the rest of them are like this, pretty tame. Like, this is uh, R-rated Twilight Zone. Right. Yeah, they don't even show boobs or anything. Not this time. I saw, like, maybe 10 years ago, the Bordello of Blood, which I believe is a feature film. Right. Featuring uh, what's his nose, the like right wing comedian guy. Dennis Miller. De- yeah, Dennis Miller, I think, is the star of that. Uh huh. I saw that one, and there was like a, this may be a like the difference between our two childhoods thing, but there was a cartoon of Tales from the Crypt on Saturday morning sometimes when I was a kid. Wow. Tales from the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> And so, like, I know the Crypt Keeper as a pull from that, primarily. Sure. But, um, yeah, I've never seen much of the live action aside from the Bordello of Blood, which I I think I watched just because it was, like, on a streaming thing that I had. And I was like, oh, I'll give this a shot. Mm-hmm. Never mm-hmm. seen one of these. And, you know, it looked like horny fun. But right. I don't remember anything about that movie. I remember being very, like, mid in the, uh-huh. like, HBO TV movie way of yeah. the 90s. Yeah, HBO at the time, hardly the prestige television that it would turn into later on. Yeah, it's kind of going back in that direction now, right? <laughs> but, I mean, this Tales from the Crypt episode features a a prestige actor, and it's actually the reason that we are talking about this episode during Greatest Trek Spring Break. It's week six, Ben. Yeah. It is a time in between new Star Trek series where we're doing deep dives into the careers of our favorite actors. And Carol Kane is someone I am not personally that familiar with. Well, Carol Kane is great. She's going to be Chief Engineer Pelia in uh, Strange New Worlds this season. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't want to hear from whatever species Pelia is from. <laughs> and I did it wrong. The Pelians notably switch bodies with people <laughs> whenever they want. She is so funny. She's on um, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, and uh, I think her character might be my favorite one on that show. There's a line from that show that like totally lives rent-free in my head, which is she she's like getting ready for something, and she comes out in this like sequined headdress, it's like, you know, like a page boy haircut, but of uh-huh. sequins and beads and shit. And <laughs> she comes out and goes, is this too Egyptian for a Seda? <laughs> I just think about that all the time. The idea that she could wear jewelry that's too Egyptian for a Seder. That's great. She's got like one of the funniest voices. She's just like a, a megawatt talent as a comedy performer. And I think it's really interesting casting that she's going to be on a show that is funny, but not a comedy. Right, yeah. 
And this is kind of a similar thing, right? Like Tales from the Crypt is like definitely horror comedy, but this is not like joke, 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 the way Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt is. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that was my experience too. And uh, ringing it at a tight sub 30 minutes, yeah. a real easy breezy episode we've got on deck today. <laughs> yeah. So uh, sit back, relax, uh, get ready for us to talk about it for 90 minutes. <laughs> How about you? Are you going to do the intro in the Crypt Keeper voice, Ben? Uh, Can I pimp you into that? Today on Greatest Trek, Judy, you're not yourself today. Is there like an episode number? I don't even know if Tales from the Crypt works that way. I've got season two, episode 11 for this one. Okay. I kind of thought that they might just be short films that they released from time to time. I didn't, I, I like literally knew nothing about Tales from the Crypt. 93 episodes of Tales from the Crypt. Wow. Ran for seven seasons up until 1996. How about that? That's great. I love a really high spec puppet and we open with the Crypt Keeper having like a spa day mm -hmm. and like an absolutely show-stopping puppet effect. The, the Crypt Keeper has one of those peel away masks on. He looks great. And actually peels it away like live on camera. Big fun. My cosmetologist said I was starting to look a little lifeless. <laughs> the premise of this one is that these people are very, like, looks conscious. At least that's how the Crypt Keeper sets it up. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and so you would expect their comeuppance to be related to their vanity, right? Right. You know, vanity being many people's favorite sin, we jump into opening credits. You know, speaking of vanity, Ben, these credits up top last a whole two minutes out of what is, I think, 26 minutes of runtime. Yeah, yeah. It's great. <laughs> We're seeing a lot of like old timey English hunting paintings. Yeah. And, you know, like the hound dogs and the red coats and the horseback riding and firing muskets kind of paintings. And once we meet Judy in her dining room, that theme carries forward. She's got a massive china hutch. She's surrounded by a lot of fancy things. And her husband, Donald, is a very fancy man. Yeah, she's doing like a, a very like British accent. Donald, my darling, who the devil are you talking to? Like one of the absolutely charming things about this to me was how crazy these characters seem. Yeah. And how, how little justification is given for how weird they are. Like, yeah. these are two people that like... <laughs> It's so funny because we, we just uh, recorded our bonus episode about Teen Wolf, which I lost track of like where things line up, but will either have just come out or will be releasing soon right. relative to the release date of this episode. And I feel like both are like weird episodes about people that drink milk and live in Pasadena. <laughs> How weird. Yeah. <laughs> they are connected. Definitely shot in like that part of Los Angeles, but what's up with the milk in Pasadena? I don't know. I mean, I, Altadena is famous for its milk. It's a yeah. whole brand of milk, <laughs> right? <laughs> I like that a lot. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. That's the kind of reaction I look to from you and our friend and agent for my jokes, right? <laughs> the like weird British accent that they dip into at times is never commented on it is never explained it's never justified it seems like they are british at the beginning but then he starts dropping the accent and then you see the palm trees and you're like what is what are these people about what's their life it seems like a storytelling contest that goes like how quickly can we make a viewer resent our main characters like <laughs> they are deeply <laughs> unlikable from jump and become more unlikable as the episode goes on. So you sort of relish in their misery. At least I do. Yeah. They're having breakfast and somebody rings the doorbell and she asks like, who could be coming around the house at this ungodly hour? I thought ungodly hours were nighttime. Hmm. I mean, maybe they pulled an all-nighter. <laughs> oh, see, maybe they're just like super gacked out on coke and yeah. that's why they're acting so weird. <laughs> Sometimes I swear you're such an odd duck. HBO can show Coke. Yeah. HBO can show flaccid penis. They can show Coke. Yeah. Show some penis. <laughs> show more penis. 
Show that Coke penis, HBO. Yeah. I bet you Max will do it. Coke and flaccid penis go together like peas and carrots, man. (laughs) (laughs) One thing about Judy and Donald is for all of their eccentricities, they are very much in love. They are so into each other. They really love each other. I'm glad they found each other. Yeah. Donald's like British aristocrat persona kind of falls away and is replaced by a uh, United States gun enthusiast persona Uh when a man from gelatin (laughs) comes and knocks at the door. On a fucking Saturday morning? Please. I guess he's like a petitioner. He's asking him to sign something recommending gun elimination legislation. I love gelatin as a writing (laughs) flourish. The gun elimination legislation activist for total international neutrality. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Great job. Yeah, really, really striking stuff. It's never okay to answer the door with a firearm in your hand, though. And this poor guy really gets an eyeful of Donald. Uh, Please forgive me. Honey, this is the man from gelatin. Hi. Yeah, he's he's demonstrating that the thing is not loaded by aiming it at his wife's head and pulling the trigger, which, uh, you know, the NRA was founded as a gun safety organization, uh-huh. and uh, one of the first things that anyone that knows anything about guns will tell you is you never point a gun at someone and you always assume it's loaded. That's where the term hair trigger came from. You aim your weapon at someone's hair <laughs> and yeah, then pull it. the trigger to test whether or not it's loaded. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Alec Baldwin learned that the hard way. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't like that. <laughs> Judy is really stressed in general, but also because of this interaction. And stress is bad for anyone's face. Everyone knows that. You see it on a person. Yeah. And even though Judy is really upset, Donald isn't concerned. No. He's got a lot of vices, like cigarettes, to to soothe his weird personality. Yeah. So, like, while she has a full meltdown looking in the mirror at her stress wrinkles, he's, uh, you know, getting ready to go off to the shooting club. <laughs> That's what he's going to spend his day doing. These people live a true life of leisure. This couple reminds me of Todd and Margot from National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation because they fight all the time. And yet they have a really horny for each other energy, right. almost like the fighting is exciting to them. Yeah. After you shower, of course. Of course. I've had uh, friends in relationships like this. Yeah. It's a lot. As a conflict-averse person, it is very hard for me to wrap my mind around this being what someone wants in a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> well, what Donald wants to do is go to the gun club, and that leaves Judy home alone. And ding-dong, again, the doorbell rings. And this time it's a solicitor from Avatar Cosmetics. And through the peephole is Happy Gilmore's mom. <laughs> you remember her? It's Frances Bay. Yeah. She's the old lady from everything of this era. She's an old lady. I mean, look at her. She's old. Is Frances Bay Michael Bay's mom? Or grandma? Hmm. I want to believe that we live in a world where that's true. I know she's related to Jimmy Bay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which our friend Chuck Bryant will appreciate and no one else. <laughs> right. Children listed is Josh Bay, and that is it. Okay. Josh Bay is not Michael Bay. No. Would you look at that? For some reason, this lady is a door-to-door makeup and cosmetics salesperson, but also, like, is withholding about the makeup and cosmetics with Judy. We have a very select clientele. She's, like, dragging Judy for the size of her pores, and Judy is, like, worried about this and it's like please sell me something anything and she's like well we we don't just sell it to anyone like you fucking knocked old lady it's great salesmanship where you have an interaction with a potential customer and then immediately pivot into the scarcity of that product or service right it's like uh you know they they say when you go on a on a car lot you've always got to be willing to walk away like your leverage is your presence and the salesperson sure. needs to know that you will walk away if you're not happy with the deal. Right. I've done this. I've performatively gotten in my car and started the engine and had the the guy like knocking on the door like, hey, come come back in. Let's, let's talk these numbers over one more time. Damn. <laughs> but uh, 
she is the sort of like salesperson that heard that and, and thought it was about the salesperson and not, and not the customer. Right, exactly. But then they kind of get distracted by her jewelry. She's wearing a ton of jewelry. She says it's junk, but uh, it's really caught the eye of Judy, who especially takes to kind of an amulet. It's very beautiful. The old lady has been invited inside at this point, and that gives them time to admire each other. The old lady admires Judy's youthful beauty, and Judy admires her Mr. T amount of necklaces that she's wearing. She's an old lady. It doesn't seem like that's wise. Well, yeah, but the the interesting backstory is that as an old lady, she also works as a bouncer at a nightclub, and she collects people's chains and wears them around their neck as sort of a lost and found type situation. There you go. And then it just became her look. Yeah. She pities the fool that doesn't wear Avatar's cosmetics. (laughs) That's it exactly. <laughs> when Judy tries on the old lady's necklace that she's admired, something magical happens between them. They both glow in a greenish Orion hue. Yeah. And then uh, the scene fades to white. Yeah, the green gets bright enough that everybody like is squinting. And yeah, it's that thing where like the the effect happens and like you don't even know. Like, you know something supernatural and fucked up just went down, but you don't know what just yet. And Donald definitely doesn't know. When he comes home later, he calls out for Judy, but the solicitor is the person who tackles him. And they roll around for a bit, and the solicitor starts telling Donald that she is his wife. Not even close. Now, where the fuck is my wife? I am your wife. And so Donald does multiple factor identification (laughs) to confirm her identity. And she answers every challenge question. Yeah. She she knows what they did the night of their wedding. Yeah. She knows how unsexy it was. She knows the whole story. Yeah. So it's a body swap is what has happened. I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. Judy's mind has been put into the Avatar cosmetic sales lady's body and vice versa. And Donald, like, immediately starts thinking about how to use a gun to solve this problem. (laughs) Yeah. He gets a call from a buddy of his that Judy, who is comically referred to as his old lady, Mm -hmm. is down at at the train station drinking like a fish. You and I have been to many train stations together, and the old timey bar just isn't a part of modern training, is it? Yeah. It's a shame. What a place this is. Is that Union Station? I have no idea. Might be Los Angeles, California's Union Station. Everyone needs a friend like Joe, though. Yeah. Joe has seen Donald's wife there slugging him back and talking a bunch of shit. She just threw back three gin and tonics, and when I sat down next to her, she told me to go to hell like she knew the way. If my wife was acting like she was real rip shit with me and was down at a bar drinking her head off... There's no fucking chance in hell anyone I know would see her. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) The the problem isn't that no one would call if they did. It's that they wouldn't see her to begin with. Yeah. Like, I don't know any bars around here to begin with, much less one that my wife would go to. And then on top of that, nobody that I know would go to the same one that my wife would go to. Good looking out by Joe. And when Donald hangs up, he knows his next stop, but... What's he going to do with the old lady who may or may not be his wife in the house? Lock her up in the closet. Yeah. He he tricks her into going in there, you know, turns the key in the door behind her and takes his his hand cannon and heads down the station. (laughs) At the train station, Donald confronts Judy in quotes, looking at herself in the mirror. His old lady. And she doesn't seem to know him. Yeah. It's a real, like, Mariah Carey, I don't know her moment for Judy. I don't know her. There's a bigness to this performance that is interesting to me. And, and like, as someone who knows of Carol Kane a little bit, like, I remember her in The Princess Bride and in Scrooged and stuff. She was minor characters in those movies. Yeah. She's got a real subtle bigness about her. Like, she's doing the blow cigarette smoke in people's faces. Yeah. Shtick. But she's not totally cartoonish about it in a fun way. And it makes me wonder what she's going to bring to her performance in Strange New Worlds. 
Right. I think she can go big with the best of them. Mm-hmm. Liar! Liar! And I think I'm especially excited to see what she does when she's trading jabs with Anson Mount, because I think that Anson Mount kind of has a similar arrow in his quiver of being able to, like... Restrained bigness? Yeah, being able to do some restrained bigness. Yeah. What are you talking about? Donald, who doesn't really come across as a thinker at the beginning of this episode, comes up with a great idea here. Yeah, inspired by a newspaper story that he sees. Yeah, he sees a story about... uh, Beavers make it to the championship basketball game. (laughs) (laughs) So he turns to her and he's like, hey, like... uh, I'm I'm just glad you're out here, like, living your life, like, not letting the cancer slow you down. And makes the Avatar cosmetic salesperson that has possessed his wife's body think that this body has a pretty close expiration date on it. And so she's going to have to get right back out of it. This is something that's within her power. I thought initially it would be necklace related. Like, you must be wearing the necklace with your counterpart and you switch only with them or like I I thought there would be more rules involved not a lot of rules evident in this it doesn't seem that way yeah because when the witch inside Judy's body starts glowing green it would appear as though they've switched back yeah they switch back in like the foyer of the house and you know the old lady is super angry and Donald like starts just fucking pumping lead into everything and it turns out he's like zero firearm control he is like firing wildly he does not appear to have picked up anything of use at his gun club he is the worst marksman ever (laughs) it's just panic firing you know but uh after he's destroyed several like porcelain figurines and dinner plates and the built-ins in their beautiful pasadena home the old lady collapses on the floor and like you sort of think that what he's going to do is that thing of a uh, character who's killed for the first time of like really wrapping their mind around and living in the horror of having taken a life. Right. The, oh no, what have I done guy? Like, I I love the suspense of this moment because you're like waiting for it and you're waiting for it and it looks like it's headed right there and then it turns out he's fucking psyched. He's like, I drew first blood. Woo, go me. <laughs> I fucking blew her away. As pumped as he is, it completely floods Judy's basement too. Like, they are yeah. into this. Sex and violence go together like... yeah. Peas and carrots. Yeah. <laughs> Later on, he takes the body of this old woman down to the rare Southern California basement and <laughs> buries her in front of his tool bench. As a newly minted Californian, I was so confused by this scene (laughs) because I thought they had like gone out to the Midwest or something. Like (laughs) if not for the stairs, I would have guessed that they were doing this in the garage, but the the stairs are conspicuous. Yeah. He has like a full, like Kevin McAllister level basement in his house. There's one detail about this burial that I want to make sure that I call attention to is that we've got a Donald with the shovel and the hole, and we've got the old lady laying next to the hole. When Donald kicks her in, that is a real actor rolling into a burial plot. And that looks extremely difficult to do while not injuring yourself. And also like not putting your hands out to protect yourself. Like, this person just takes the fall. I think it is Francis Bay in this shot. I thought it was too. Like, I didn't, I couldn't say for certain, but yeah. if it's her, amazing stunt. Because there's another actor credited as playing the corpse later, but I think You this... think that's a different corpse? Well, I thought it was, I thought that like the, the makeup effect corpse was a different yeah. person maybe. Yeah. I don't know. 
Anyways, uh, whoever it is, they sell the shit out of it. And I mean, there must be like a mattress in the bottom of the hole. But but even still, like if you were kicked off of a height of a couple of feet onto a mattress, the instinct to do anything besides roll limply from that height is incredible. Hard to overcome. Yeah. The like feeling of having dirt shoveled onto you after that also like a thing that you're going to have to suppress your instincts around to sell the scene that always impresses me like in the miriam movies and tvs where you always see the shovel full hit the body's face (laughs) i don't know how the person playing the body ever does that without flinching yeah wild shit yeah so they put the amulet that initiated the body swap into the safe in their house because uh you know, they've like tried to destroy it other ways. They they put it on their uh, their miter saw, like the uh, the statue in Devil's Revenge, and mm-hmm. that didn't work. You can't destroy it. Turns out this thing can only be destroyed in the fires of Mount Mordor, from whence it came. Cast it into the fire. I mean, he tried shooting it, right? <laughs> That's probably the first thing he tried. Yeah. This guy's got real like Homer gets a gun and changes the channel on the TV with the gun energy. <laughs> Yeah, he really does. The crypt keeper made such a big deal out of like how obsessed they were with their appearance and almost nothing about the gun obsession <laughs> this guy has. Not at all. Now, the the gun obsession just played for lulls. For everything Judy has been through, I'm kind of shocked at her admiration for the jewelry itself. I agree. She is very obsessed with it, but Maybe that's part of its supernatural draw. Yeah, that's got to be it, because I would be too afraid to ever go near it, ever, if I was Judy. Babe, you've got a witch buried in your basement. Get a grip on reality. It still has to have a hold on her. I think that's the only in-story explanation. Yeah. We cut to three months later. A passage of time that seems... Irrelevant, really. Yeah. Kind of arbitrary. Like, for some reason, these things happened three months later. It seems like they could have happened at any point. Donald is sleeping peacefully in his bed, and she is, like, up late obsessing, I guess, about the amulet. And when she snaps awake, like, God, she just does that thing where you've had a nightmare and you just bolt up. (laughs) It is wild. She heads straight for the safe. Yeah. And at that exact moment, Donald is jolted awake in in much the same way. And he's wearing Tony the Tiger, the pajama set. Yeah. And also keeps a loaded gun, probably under his pillow. For being as jumpy as he is, he probably should not be keeping that gun where he keeps it. No, not at all. The perverse thing about being that jumpy is that you like convince yourself that you need the loaded gun. The most perverted way this guy sleeps is with thick... Tony the Tiger pajamas. They're great. It's fucking Southern California. This house does not look like it has central. Like, what no. are they doing? No, he's sleeping hot. You know he is. Ugh. Ugh. He's got a stink when he wakes up from all the sweat. Yeah. So Donald tells Judy that he's thinking of burying the witch somewhere else. It, this has been a thing on their minds for a long time. Evidently waking up from a nightmare in this way. Yeah. Fairly commonplace over the last three months. Yeah. And maybe the nightmares will subside... Once they do a little reburial, yeah, these bad dreams are just no good. So he's gonna go get a uh, glass of milk for himself, and uh, she's like, "Really, a glass of milk? You're like an adult. You're gonna just drink a glass of milk?" And Donald's like, "Well, yeah, this is Pasadena. Like, <laughs> legally, we have to drink milk all the time here. Whenever we're depicted in a movie or television show, it's in the city charter. Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't you know it?" This witch is very much alive and has somehow freed itself from the burial plot. Yeah. Took her three months to dig herself out. The face appears to be the only thing that is decomposed on the entire body. (laughs) And this face is grotesque. Yeah. We were talking recently about how many different ways the makeup department on Star Trek Voyager had come up with for making somebody's face look fucked up. Yeah. They didn't do this. No. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah this is just like a physical fight <laughs> between him and the corpse ish 
body of the old lady and he's like looking for a gun, but he's like getting picky. Like he pulls the top drawer out of an armoire and is like, not that gun, not that gun. Oh, there's the gun I'm looking for. You got to have the right gun for the job. Yeah. Just then Judy comes downstairs and it looks like she's kind of like going out, right? She's got like a hat on and dress on. Yeah, there's something unusual about how she's dressed. Primarily is is she's wearing a, a type of veil or a hat with a veil on it. Yeah. This is one of many things that lead us to realize that it's the corpse body that he's fighting that is actually Judy now. And uh, they've swapped bodies again. By getting that amulet out, she uh, exposed herself to re-swapinating. Exactly. Big mistake, Judy. Yeah. And so they have to do that thing like in Star Trek VI, right? Where there's two Kirks. Surprise! <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Got to figure out which of them to shoot. Yeah. Not me, you idiot. Him! Which of them to give a big kiss to. Yeah. For who it was a lifelong ambition right. and so forth. Yeah. Whether or not there's a stockade. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and Donald's check here gives it away. Yeah. He's like, uh, hey, get these keys to the Jag. Start her up and wait for me. Classic Jag gag. Yeah. That's how Donald knows that uh, Judy's not the real Judy. And in the struggle over the keys, he shoots her. Yeah. And as she lays dying, she grabs the necklace and the entire group turns green. Yeah. The amulet goes back into effect and it seems like Judy dies and the witch slash makeup sales lady lives. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man, it's just one of those, like, live by the NRA handbook, <laughs> die by the NRA handbook <laughs> moments. What does the NRA handbook suggest you do now? Judy? Yeah, I mean, the last scene is, is Donald crying, holding his dead wife that he has shot. And like descending back into a British accent and doing weird like 007 bits. Amazing. Like, what an ending. She is shuffling loose this mortal coil and he's like doing a character. Like, it'd be like if my wife was dying in my arms and I was like, I do not remember <laughs> <laughs> what caused your untimely demise. You might be confused about how to experience this moment, but I think the Crypt Keeper is instrumental in this because as soon as we leave the scene and we're back with him, he just rapid fires the dunks yeah. on Donald and Judy at the end. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> we're on the Crypt Keeper side. These guys suck. <laughs> Sometimes I crack myself up. <laughs> Team Crypt. <laughs> yeah. It is big fun. Yeah. Wild Ride. I guess I just want to know, did you like this episode of Tales from the Crypt, Adam? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I love the Crypt Keeper. You were talking about like the rapidity of the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt in terms of like joke frequency yeah it's just that tina fey like anybody that's watched 30 rock knows what this means like they just yeah. like every line is a joke in one way or another and the joke density just couldn't be higher in that show i feel like the crypt keeper could be in that writer's room the crypt oh, yeah. really fast the crypt keeper isn't doing like the funniest bits but he is doing the kind of patter that you need to have all throughout a show like that to keep the the joke ball in the air right He's important for the room. His hygiene is awful, though. So yeah. I think the other writers would resent him for that. Yeah. yeah you may yeah. want to have the Crypt Keeper working remotely, mm -hmm. I think. That's probably <laughs> ideal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But those Zoom rooms, they don't quite produce the same magic as, yeah. the, as the real deal. Yeah. I mean, as a one episode only Tales from the Crypt person, I had a swell time with this one. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Easy breezy 28 minutes. Uh, very funny. And I think gave me a good indication of the range of, of Carol Kane, both from what I saw here and what I knew of her from a couple of movies. Like, she's great. She's great. She's a beloved legend for a reason, and I'm looking forward to seeing her in Strange New Worlds. I am too, Adam. I think that um, 
my hunch, and I don't know this for sure, but my hunch about this episode is a lot of the character weirdness and Britishness stuff might have come from her. Oh. Like, I think she is like funny and weird enough that the way it read to me, and this is like a hundred percent speculation, is that she showed up on set and saw all the like weird porcelain dolls and set decoration they had done and said, like, this character is like such a freak. I'm gonna like play her as British sometimes. And then like got the dude playing Donald to kind of play along with that and I think it really adds to the piece, like wherever it came from, it's fucking hilarious and weird. And I really liked Judy, you're not yourself today as well. And I'm really looking forward to Carol Kane on Strange New Worlds because she's one of my faves. Yeah. Big season ahead. Fun exercise during spring break. You got to exercise during spring break. Yeah. How are you going to get your, uh, your beach bod yeah. otherwise? No other way. Well, no other way to... Pay for the show than recording priority one messages. Ben, you want to see what we have over in the box? Yeah, but just to clarify, people can also just support yeah. like monthly or you know use one of our promo codes when they hear an ad. Like there, there are other ways. To be clear, I was reductive with that. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Adam, our first priority one message is from Zach, and it's to Mitch. It goes like this: Thanks, you sob for turning me on to Ben and Adam's great pods. After 35 years of bonding over Trek, this is truly the best way to carry it forward. I know this has been a shit year for you with your big C diagnosis and treatment. I want to enlist Ben and Adam and all other FODs to send you good recovery vibes. Live long and prosper, motherfucker. Wow. Beat this thing down, Mitch. Yeah. You can do it. You got it. Mitch, we believe in you. Big C is not a cool or fun diagnosis to get, but uh, we're pulling for you, and I know that the rest of the friends of DeSoto for sure are as well. And uh, it sounds like you got a really great pal in Zach. Hopefully you can find a podcast that keeps your spirits up. Yeah. Uh, Best of luck finding one of those. Yeah, maybe one of the other ones on MaximumFun.org. Probably not this one. Probably not either of those either. Probably, uh, probably got to look pretty far to find something mm. that fits the yeah. bill. Maybe Wondery. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Get well soon, Mitch. Ben, our second priority one message is from FM. <laughs> it is to Ducky. The message goes like this. Happy 40th birthday to you, Sir Lord Duckington Belmont III. Okay. I hope your day is filled with tacos. Thank you for continuing to be my adventure friend. RSVP wedding birthday. As well as the greatest ducky that ever quack quacked. Lubs. We didn't get a pronunciation guide or anything for fm. I want to tell the friends of DeSoto that that was spelled in the copy as F-M-O-O-H. How would you do it? Is it maybe FMU? Maybe it is FMU. But what's the H there for then, if it's FMU? Well, if you take the F and the M out, it just looks like OO, so maybe that is the pronunciation I should have used instead of FMU. I think FMU is what tracks, though. It's like roof. <laughs> it is like roof. It is exactly like roof. And we're both Philadelphians, so that's how we pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, happy 40th to Ducky. Yeah, happy 40th to Ducky. Glad you've got an adventure friend in FMA. If you uh, would like to send well wishes to someone or promote something on our show, we appreciate it. It's one of the many ways that you can support what we do. Maximumfun.org slash Jumbotron. Hey, Ben. What's that, Adam? Did you discover yourself in Edward Larkin? I think I got to give it to Donald. The like crazy, like firing the gun into the atmosphere and then like getting psyched when you take a life energy of Donald. Yeah. What what a fucking tool. I feel so alive. It's a dark Larkin. Yeah. Give me a break. How about you? I mean, for me, it's there aren't many options here. No. To be clear, there are only a couple of characters. Very few characters. I'm going to make mine Joe. 
Joe down at the bar. He's just down at the train station having a drink at the watering hole. Maybe the train station is his local. That would be kind of cool. It would be. It's a pretty cosmopolitan local. Like, nobody's local is the airport, right? Because you can't go to the bar in the airport unless you've got sure. a boarding pass. I like Joe's energy. I'm also, I think, a great secret keeper. Mm. And it made me think a lot about the level at which you finally call Donald. Because <laughs> if I'm at a bar and I see Judy and I'm really good friends with Donald, a drink or two in there, I'm not going to say a word. Judy's business is Judy's business. Yeah, sure. Sure. Judy acting all crazy in the train station bar maybe rises to the level of giving Donald a call, but the totality of the whole thing right. is what pushes Joe over the edge. Joe's got a limit. Judy reached it. He's trying to be a good friend, but you got to believe that he did not want to make that call. No. No one wants to make that call. <laughs> That's why Joe is my Edward Larkin. Ah, oh, man. And like, think about how much more prevaricating you have to do about making a tricky call like that. Not prevaricating. Think about how much more perseverating you have to do about making a call like that when you, the way you And you could have used either of those words and I would have been like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when you have to ask the bartender to bring the phone over. <laughs> when you're at a train station bar and you're just perversicating uh, all by yourself, what are you going to do in that situation? I agree. Yeah, you said it, dude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can't just text Donald and be like, your wife's here. What gives, you know? Yeah. In a text-based communication universe, I can read in all kinds of ways that you don't intend. Yeah. Text is hard. It can really make you prevaricate. I know. <laughs> all right, Adam. <laughs> Well, that was a lot of fun. Great words, man. Great words by you this episode. Yeah, go look them up, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I think one means lie and the other means like worry over. At this point in the episode, I have lost track of which is which. <laughs> I love it. Adam, I want to share a warning bois with the friends of DeSoto. Of course, the warning bois are a part of the show where we... Uh, Shout out some nice words from a social media app or a nice review of the show. We appreciate when the friends of DeSoto spread the word in a way that invites in the people who would appreciate what we do and warns off those who would not. Yeah, we don't want the people who don't appreciate us. <laughs> there are many shows for those people. Yeah, they get plenty. Prepare a buoy and launch it when ready. Warning buoys. An emergency buoy. A warning buoy. Well, Adam, there's a warning boy here that is very timely because tomorrow, as of the release of this episode, we will be live on stage in Brooklyn, New York, doing the re-encounter at Farpoint. I have no idea if there's even tickets available at this point. Probably not. Yeah, but people should check, you know. Sure. If they're interested. Yes. This is from Love Letters Co. on Twitter. I bought another pair of tickets to At Greatest Trek, and I swear on my life. If my patient husband bails again at the last minute, I am divorcing him. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. no. Elle is going to divorce her patient husband if he bails again on going to a Greatest Trek show. That's the stakes for Elle. Elle has been a longtime friend of DeSoto. And, yeah. I mean, he who is her husband <laughs> better fucking get with the program. Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty clear what's at stake here. Yeah. Uh, L rules. L uh, plays Pikmin Bloom with me sometimes. Wow. I'm so excited for this show. It's uh, greatestgentour.com for tickets to that, if there are still tickets available. Yeah. If you're in New York, you really don't have an excuse. Afternoon show, chill afternoon hangs with us. Yeah. Have you outside in the blazing sunlight mm -hmm. in time for a patio dinner somewhere? Yeah. There you go. Maybe we'll do a meetup with FODs after. This all sounds great. We'll have to figure out what that's going to look like. This is something to look forward to. I can't wait. Yeah. Can't wait for the re-encounter at Farpoint. Can't wait for Strange New World Season 2. Yeah. You and me both. That's coming right up. But we got, a, uh, got another episode, one more episode of Spring Break before we get back into the warm embrace of Strange New Worlds. And you're going to hear all about it from Wendy. 
Shit, we're not going to talk about it? We're going to make them listen to Wendy about it? Oh, yeah. Wow. Wendy's going to do great. Well, thank you, Bolians and Gorns, for tuning in to this very special episode of Greatest Trek. <laughs> that is an impression that made me precipitate. <laughs> hey, you're like Mr. Thorne in Teen Wolf. <laughs> Greatest Trek is an Uxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. It's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica, and it's produced and edited by Wendy Pretty. Next week, final week of spring break, Ben and Adam will be looking back at the pilot episode of the AMC original series, Hell on Wheels, starring Anson Mount. You can find that on AMC Plus, and it's also available free with ads on Roku and a couple of other sites in the U.S. Thank you to Adam Ragusea for composing all of the original music for this show. He has a podcast and a YouTube cooking channel that's always insightful and interesting. You can find those by searching for Adam Ragusea. Thanks to Nick Ditmore for creating the show art and Bill Tilly for managing the At Greatest Trek social media pages on Instagram, Twitter, and Mastodon. Make sure you're following those accounts and use the hashtag Greatest Trek when you talk about the show online. Your five-star ratings and reviews are also greatly appreciated, as are the many friends of DeSoto who support the production of the show. You can join them by setting up a membership at MaximumFun.org slash join. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on Greatest Trek. MaximumFun.org Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.